So I would like to thank uh, all of the organizers for uh, it's uh, very nice to be back here in uh, in IHS um, and for putting together such a nice group of people. And um <coughs> uh, I should also apologize uh, to <laughs> on two two points. So one is that uh, I have. Uh, um, it has been uh, a number of years since I was working actively on this topic, so my memory is maybe not uh, as fresh as it should have been otherwise. And the other one is that I was hoping to to have a last week to um, to get a little bit more into it, but then I had a cold, as you might um <coughs> recognize. So, so um, you should have to bear with me. Uh, so I plan to focus more on the spectral properties of the membrane matrix models and discuss the difference between sort of the classical um, side, the quantum and the super symmetric um <coughs> matrix models that arise from the membrane. Uh, so the, the plan is to uh, give a little bit more of the introduction. So we have already heard um, many uh, of the talks have uh, focused on, on uh, you know, bringing to our attention the different aspects of these um, uh, models, but I think it does not hurt to, to point out a few extra things. And uh, also, I, I believe that in this audience there are um, several people who are not experts in this area, so I think it could be nice to, to um <coughs> understand this in more detail. And then focus around the spectrum and uh, in particular the ground state conjecture. So this is the concerning whether the uh, lowest point of the spectrum, which turns out to cover the positive real axis, whether this, uh, the point zero is um, an uh, eigenvalue or not, whether there is exists a, a normalizable uh, eigenstate. <coughs> and then I will discuss various approaches to the study of ground states. There have been many over the years and I have been involved in some of these and provide some outlook. So uh, if we recall, we're considering a, um, a bosonic membrane. So let's start with the bosonic case. So this just means that we have the embedding of a membrane in sort of world volume into uh, space time. And uh, <coughs> so if the, the picture one could keep in mind is sort of that we have, okay, this is uh, some, some surface and then we have uh, <coughs> some time dimension which is sweeping out the world volume. Um, <coughs> and uh, so sigma is um, fixed. You know, we fix the, let's fix the topology as, as a start and then um <coughs> 2D compact manifold. And then we have the embedding coordinate functions, so x. And here I'm working in the sort of light front, the light con uh, coordinate framework. So even though the embedding space-time is r, so 1 plus little d will be uh, my parameter in these models, <coughs> and then one time dimension. So d is essentially the uh, transversal coordinates to the, uh, to the membrane. Um, so we have d such uh, embedding coordinate functions into... <coughs> um, yeah, one for each of the coordinates. And then <coughs> uh, there is this issue of um, um, writing down the Hamiltonian. So this is after having done this reduction into uh, the light from coordinates and looking at the internal energy <coughs> on the membrane. Uh, so this energy is given by this Hamiltonian um, function on the phase space. So we have this x um, coordinate functions, but also there are the con conjugate momenta, p. So, uh, <coughs> so this is then just an integral over this um, fixed um, uh, surface here. If you want to think of it as having, maybe there is a, some hole in it. Uh, and um <coughs> we have the momenta squared, and then there is this uh, Poisson bracket. Uh, so you have the, the Poisson bracket of the uh, coordinate functions squared to sort of provide for you the, the volume of this thing. And um, so we have es essentially two Poisson structures here. One is given by the, the surface, sigma, uh, 
And here I might have set this uh, normalization to one, this um, density to one, but, uh, but there's some, <coughs> some flexibility there. <coughs> and uh, so this is one of the Poisson structures that we use, uh, which is sort of canonical given is, since it's a, it's a, it's a two-dimensional surface. But then we also have the dynamical Poisson bracket. So um, these uh, coordinate functions and the momenta should be uh, canonically conjugate. So that's, that's this po Poisson bracket in the end here that uh, have been normalized in this way. <coughs> and I can say also that some of the details concerning the dimensional reduction from the full theory down to this uh, setting, uh, you have to sort of eliminate some constraints and so on. There have been some discussion in a paper with uh, De Wool and Hoppe. Um, <coughs> then we go over to the matrix context and, um, and as we have seen we should then uh, replace this uh, Poisson algebra of functions on the surface. Uh, actually they have also been normalized so we have taken away essentially the um, center of mass and so on so that they are zero mean real valued functions xj and then we represent this Poisson algebra in terms of matrices. So we're then going over to uh, an algebra of traceless Hermitian and Bayan matrices. So the tracelessness is from the zero mean and the Hermitian from the real uh, valued uh, uh, functions. And then it's just n is the matrix size. And then uh, in this uh, representation we, we represent the Poisson bracket by the commutator of the matrices. <coughs> and the uh, integral on the surface goes over to the trace. And then the, the nice feature here is that there is a convergence, so we can essentially, a little bit independently of the, of the actual topology and so on of the, of this, of the uh, surface, we can arrange a basis of our uh, uh, traceless Hermitian matrices such that the, com uh, the structure constants in this basis converges uh, to the given one. Yes. So if you wanted to use higher genus surfaces to parametrize your membranes, how would that show up on the right hand side? So then I think you would need to choose a different basis uh, which gives you those uh, structure constants. But maybe, maybe Jens would be the most uh, suited to... What we did, it was discussed um, earlier, so this answer is the following. Uh, there is an abstract theorem, um, I mean many different aspects, but one for instance, uh, Bordemann, Mein Rankin, Schlichenmeier, who proved that for any genus surface, uh, the algebra of the matrix algebra uh, can, be, can be taken to converge to the genus G surface. Uh, but it is not known what basis to explicitly take for higher genus surfaces. I mean, these matrices in which you get the structure constants F, A, B, C are um, only known for tori and spheres. Okay. Yeah, so there's, a, there's an existence of a, ba there's a sequence of bases and uh, thus a sequence of structure constants in those bases such that you get convergence. Okay. But there's, yeah, the details is a bit more tricky. Um, <coughs> but the whole idea here is that it respects this um, um, representation somehow respects the symmetries or if you want the constraints of the theory. So we had uh, in the original membrane theory we had the diffeomorphism invariance <coughs> um, on, on the surface <coughs> and uh, actually area preserving diffeomorphisms um, because we, have somehow we want to conserve the area. And then uh, this in the matrix model side is uh, represented as a SUN invariance. So the, uh, the special unitary because of also this uh, area preserving constraint. Um, so, so we have uh, then the, the Hamiltonian, which we have seen as now a trace over sort of the momentum side of the matrices squared. And then you have the commutator squared. <coughs> Uh, over all the pairs of, of the matrices and if you want to write this down in terms of a basis say of SUN um, some standard basis then you have just the sum of the momenta squared and then we have um, 
we have uh, yeah the the um, structure constants, and then so this would be the commutator square. And then still we have um, uh, we still have so the the canonical Poisson brackets between the uh, coordinate and momentum uh, variables here. But now there's only finitely many of them. So that's the, the whole idea here, that if since we have a finite dimensional system, we can then uh, quantize this in the standard way, using the Schrodinger quantization. So, uh, <coughs> so we re represent this um, set of uh, coordinates and momenta on the square integrable functions uh, over the corresponding dimension. So we had the d space dimensions, and then uh, this is the matrix dimension. Uh, or the, <coughs> the basis, uh, the number of elements of a basis of, of, of this uh, space. And then we represent uh, our um, uh, xj as just multiplication operators on this space. So we have expanded it in, in this basis ta. And while the momenta is represented in terms of derivatives, so minus i times the derivative with respect to xj, in order to, to represent the, <coughs> the canonical commutation relations. So then uh, our Hamiltonian that we had, um, the sum of p squares goes over to the Laplacian acting on this space. And then we have a um, scalar potential essentially, which depends on the coordinates. <coughs> and I will come back to the details on, on this potential. But what we have here is also uh, symmetries. So uh, we have um, essentially the d-dimensional um, space and the rotations may be represented within this. Uh, essentially the Hamiltonian commutes with such rotations, but it also commutes with um, uh, rotations in the, in the uh, matrix space, so, so SUN transformations, which are then represented if you in, the, in, this, um <coughs> in this basis by orthogonal transformations as well. So uh, but what we have to remember is that we had um, uh, we have these constraints of diffeomorphism invariance. So we still have that constraint which we have to implement. So actually the physical Hilbert space is not the whole space here, but rather this is where I wrote the sort of bosonic Hilbert space physical, which is then the SUN invariant states. So uh, the SUN, uh, so the generators of the SUN symmetry can be written in terms of this basis uh, with the structure constant like this. Uh, and that acting on, on our states should be zero. <coughs> so that's how we implement the constraints. And this is sort of just amounts to the standard Dirac con constraint quantization procedure that we still have some constraints. So we will look for um, to solve those constraints on the quantum side. Th this is a constraint, this one? Uh, this one is a constraint, yes. So, so, so uh, this is <laughs> at this point, I don't remember. Uh, yeah, it could be a second class at this point. So yeah, but you have to. This is probably written in, <coughs> in this paper. <coughs> okay. Um, so then we have this complication of um, supersymmetry. If we want to consider the supersymmetric uh, membrane, so the idea is to somehow add the uh, spin degrees of freedom and uh, obtain a supersymmetric theory. So, um, so I will say s just something briefly about supersymmetric quantum mechanics, because uh, it's not the full uh, you know, supersymmetric quantum field theory here, but it's really a reduced uh, thing into the quantum mechanics. So then it can be um, more simply stated. So essentially a supersymmetric quantum mechanics, you can think of having a, a couple of different objects. So uh, one thing is the, there's a Hilbert space, there's a grading operator K, there's a Hamiltonian, and then there's uh, supercharges, so supercharge operators. So, the, so yeah, you have a Hilbert space, the grading operator is just an operator upon the operator square into one. So you can sort of split the Hilbert space into a <coughs> positive and negative part, or you know, the eigenspaces of this. Uh, and you can term this the even sector and the odd sector. And then this uh, Hamiltonian operator, it should be even res with respect to this grading. So it should map even to even and odd to odd. <coughs> and it should be a self-adjoint operator. 
but then you have these supercharged operators Q, J, and if there are n, uh, the curly n of them, that we say that there is an n extended supersymmetry. These should be odd operators, so they are mapping uh, the even to the odd and the odd to the even. So we're sort of interchanging these, these spaces. And they should satisfy essentially this uh, Clifford type algebra that, uh, so okay, a square of an QJ should be the Hamiltonian, but they should also anti commute. Um, <coughs> so this is um, the, the um, definition of this supersymmetric quantum mechanics. And some nice properties of, of that are implied just by this structure is that your Hamiltonian will necessarily be non-negative operator, because it's the square of, okay, I should say these are, in this formulation, these are self-adjoint operators also. Um, so the spectrum of the Hamiltonian has to be on the positive real line. Then there is uh, a pairing between uh, the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. So if you actually have an eigenstate with a positive energy of the Hamiltonian, so say that you have it and you can have, you know, use the splitting, so you can say that, say that you have an even state, for instance, with positive energy, then by just acting on it with the supercharge, we get to the odd uh, sector. So you would have uh, an eigenstate with the same eigenvalue E um, on that sector. So there's always a pairing for the higher energy eigenvalues, but not necessarily on the zero uh, energy sector. <coughs> because then you would annihilate the state by acting on Q. So, um, so this is used, for instance, in, in index theorems and so on to, um, to, to spot whether there is a zero energy state or not. Okay, and then in, this, um, in the supersymmetric formulation, what we want to do is somehow to, instead of having SOD as the rotation uh, group symmetry, we want to have a spin D <coughs> represented uh, non-trivially in, in, in our space. So we're considering actually uh, representations, both sort of spin representations with respect to the, the RD uh, space, but also with respect to the sort of the matrix space. And these are, should be represented as some bounded um, operators on some Fox space or some, you know, the Hilbert space of the model. Um, so we then have to go to Clifford algebras to construct such representations. So starting with the, the d-dimensional space, <coughs> and we're looking at corresponding Clifford algebra uh, over d-dimensions, so say gamma matrices, uh, satisfying the anti-commutation relations. And then you take an irreducible representation for these, um, these matrices, <coughs> or just you know, the ma a certain matrix size. And I call this n D. So this depends on the dimension, and there is a certain natural uh, irreducible representation here. Then you construct over this space <laughs> that you got, uh, you then uh, sort of couple that to these matrices, uh, to the matrix degrees of freedom, and then you construct a Clifford algebra uh, on top of that space. So then we go up in dimension a bit more. Uh, and then you consider the irreducible representations of that, uh, algebra and that will be even bigger. So then it's uh, the dimension is two to the uh, and then it's essentially this uh, this dimension here and d times n squared minus one and then uh, half of that. <coughs> and we will see explicitly how you construct these things. This uh, in in one way. Really a real representation of the gamma matrix. Yeah. So here we consider a, actually a complex representation, but you can you can ask whether you should w you know want a real or a complex one. But typically, um, at this, so, so here it's uh, the first stage is, uh, yeah, so it depends a bit what kind of structure we can get. So I will come to this soon. But uh, so this real representation in certain dimensions, this turns out to be actually a complex or a quaternionic representation. And then you can use that. So, so um, but on this stage, uh, you know, you can also ask, should you have a real or, no or not? But let's uh, think of just a complex case in this case. Otherwise, it would be more complicated here. Um, so what happens in this picture is that we, so adding to our bosonic Hamiltonian, so the, the, uh, the kinetic energy essentially plus the, the scalar potential, we add this um, <coughs> um, so spin degrees of freedom or these uh, fermionic operators 
the theta, <coughs> and they are coming with a linearly in the coordinates x. So the rest is just these sort of structural constants. And then uh, it turns out that you can uh, write down a set of supercharges. So the number of supersymmetries essentially is this dimension here. Uh, and uh, so you have a linear in momenta and then a, a quad a, um, a quadratic in, in the axis. And then coupled to these Fermi variables. And then it turns out that for certain dimensions, these um, satisfy this uh, supersymmetry algebra that um, the anti-commutator of such supercharges gives you the Hamiltonian. But there will be an additional part here. But it turns out that on the physical Hilbert space, so this is just the uh, generators of SUN, so on the physical Hilbert space this piece vanishes. So you have, it closes up to this supersymmetry algebra. So uh, in order to understand this requirement, uh, one needs to know a little bit more about Clifford algebras and so on, but I don't have so much time to get into it, but let me just, I think it's useful to have sort of this table. So this is the uh, dimension, this Rd, and then you consider the corresponding Clifford algebra. And these are well known to be just uh, essentially matrix algebras or a sum of two matrix algebras. But the matrices are, uh, have a real or complex or quaternionic structure. Um, so, uh, uh, so this is just the dimension of, of, uh, of the um, Euclidean space that we construct this Clifford algebra over. And then this is the dimension of the irreducible representation of the Clifford algebra. And it's you can read off from, from this side. And then I have uh, I essentially just written what sort of the structure is in, this, in these spaces, whether there is an additional complex or quaternionic structure. And then uh, on the right hand side here is what happens when you act, essentially how can spin D be represented on these spaces. And then there is an additional splitting uh, <coughs> into either you have just um, uh, essentially an irreducible representation or it splits into two either different or the same representations. So actually you can see that the, the special dimensions where you have these, um, uh, these supersymmetries, uh, the, the case so for, for, for my label of D here, it's the two, three, five, and nine cases. So this is what I've marked with the arrows here. Um, and it turns out, so in the two case, essentially the structure is real, but in the three case, the structure is complex, and you can use that. Uh, and also in the five dimensional case, there's a quaternionic structure, which you also can use. While in the, the highest dimensional case, which is of the most interest, is essentially a real structure, but it turns out that there's sort of octonionic <laughs> features in this case also. I have also indicated this, this one here, which is somehow a degenerate case, the one-dimensional case. So, um, so this is somehow, if you want some kind of zero-dimensional thing. You know. so, so this is again related to the fact that you have um, essentially the, the norm division algebras are the real complex quaternionic and octonionic ones. And this is sort of the same thing which appears here, which has to do with Clifford algebras. Okay, so I might come back to, to, this, uh, to this table. Um, <coughs> so now our full Hilbert space is then the bosonic one times the fermionic Fox space, where we have represented these, these Clifford algebras. And then uh, again, there's a uh, physical Hilbert space, um, which uh, where these constraints vanish. But now it's not only that um, bosonic sector, but there's also a fermionic part here. Uh, so that's uh, imposed as a constraint that uh, we should be in, 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 the, in the kernel of these operators. But then you still have also a symmetry, sort of a rotation or spin D symmetry which is then uh, essentially uh, rotation among the coordinates and then also rotation on these um, Clifford algebras or on the fermionic Fox space. Um, so what we'd like to emphasize here is also that how we can construct these Fox space representations. So essentially the, the um, one way which was used by David Hoppe and, and Nikolai is to um, to, to essentially you, you, you pair up, you have to, so you given these thetas, <coughs> this Clifford algebra, you can sort of pair them up to construct um, creation and annihilation operators. 
So uh, one way is just sort of, okay, you, you take the first half and the second half and, and pair those up. And then uh, you have, a, you, you have a essentially creation annihilation um, fermionic operators, satisfying canonical algebra like this. And uh, what has been done essentially is to, um, to split the space. So, so um, along with this pairing, <coughs> you use a, a splitting of the, of the d dimension space into d minus two variables, and then the last two you use as a sort of complex variable. So you can take the real and the imaginary part of that. So I've here written x prime is sort of the first set of variables here, and then z is uh, the pairing of the two uh, last variables, d minus one and d. And if you do that, this sort of goes well together and you can write down the Hamiltonian in terms of these creation and relation operators. So then there will be a part which involves these, these first variables here. Uh, and so big gamma is sort of the redu reduction of these um, gamma matrices in terms of, of this splitting. Uh, and then you have uh, uh, the, um, the last part. Is the so, so this first part sort of preserves the fermion number. But uh, in the last two parts, you have a raising of two or lowering of two um, fermions. Um, so in this sense, the whole operator will sort of mix the fermionic uh, sectors. <coughs> but there is this alternative in three and five dimensions, which I'm not sure how much it has been well discussed. Okay, it's also been used by Clotson and Halpern. Um, and then uh, discuss this a little bit in, in my thesis that in these special cases, since you have this complex or quaternionic structure, you can use that pairing, um, which gives you a more ca sort of canonical <laughs> pairing of the fermions. Uh, so that in that case, your Hamiltonian can be written. So using this other pairing, uh, you have uh, essentially, sp um, yeah, so your Hamiltonian is then the bosonic, and then you have a, a piece which uh, conserves the fermion number. And then the, um, <coughs> the SUN and the spin D uh, generators are in also sort of preserving fermion number. Then there was this degenerate model, um, which essentially, so it's the one dimensional case, which essentially is just a free uh, Laplacian uh, acting on the on the matrix degrees of freedom. And then there's a, a piece which vanishes on the, on the physical Hebrew space. Uh, so one way to, uh, the corresponding um, supercharge, so there's only one supercharge in this case, it's essentially just uh, you know, a theta times a derivative. So this is like a Dirac um, operator. And its square is this Hamiltonian on the physical Hilbert space. But there's also here an alternative. So either you sort of work with this or you construct uh, an what you can call somehow cohomological uh, version, uh, which is, um, uh, so there's a, a way to also introduce uh, fermionic creation annihilation operators. And then you have a Q, which is not self-adjoint, but you also have a Q star such that they, they sort of close up this uh, <coughs> supersymmetry algebra. Uh, let me not spend too much on that. So, so uh, now we come to the question of what about the, um, the spectra of this model. So we had the classical side and just the, the membrane or its regularized version. And then we had the, the, the quantum regularized membrane and the quantum supermembrane. Um, and one way to understand these uh, differences is using toy models, which has been very fruitful. So if we start with the classical model, <coughs> uh, we have this uh, Hamiltonian again, the trace of, of these momenta, and then th the potential, which we should uh, note is a non-negative potential here. Um <coughs> and a toy model that you can keep in mind. So if I maybe we can write it here. So um, essentially we have um, the uh, a toy model potential which only depends on two variables, so it's in R2, and it's x squared, y squared. <coughs> so uh, the feature here is that there's uh, certain flat directions. So if we think about this, 
for a model we have this in the xy plane then along the coordinate axis <coughs> the, va the potential vanishes but then it uh, it somehow increases rapidly transversally to these cases so um, this is indeed the picture that arises here that uh, in in this uh, matrix model potential you have vanishing directions where all of these matrices are commuting so it's essentially such a such a asymptotic direction so you can really go out to infinity uh, while the potential vanishes uh, but the the important feature is that while you move in such a potential valley the valley also gets steeper and steeper in this uh, <coughs> in the transverse direction so the, because of this narrowing it turns out that you can actually uh, yeah th there's a, a difference on the quantum side but if you just consider uh, moving with a fixed energy in this uh, potential well then you can indeed escape I in the well to infinity so in this sense it's an unconfined potential so on the quantum side <coughs> so we are then considering this Schrodinger operator uh, essentially the Laplacian here plus this scalar potential and then again <coughs> it's uh, yeah, both of these operators non non-negative um, but uh, the important feature is this narrowing of the potential values here so we can again consider this um, a toy model um, Hamiltonian so on the quantum side here so this is the bosonic toy model which is then just uh, uh, you know the Laplacian on, on uh, in the two dimensions plus this <coughs> this potential and here you can use essentially this illustration but uh, it's a little bit more complicated on the matrix side but essentially the, the same kind of computation that um, so considering this operator <coughs> you, you use what is sort of happening along the valleys here uh, to, to bound this operator from below by something which has a, which has a discrete spectrum um, so, um, so what you can do is sort of take uh, you take half of your uh, momenta here uh, and you sort of put, put and it, you, you split your potential into two, two pieces half and a half and then you take also half of the, the x momentum put it here half of the y momentum put it there and then you consider these two parts here separately so this if you recognize it's just like a harmonic oscillator uh, <coughs> in the x variable with a frequency uh, y here so this is just bounded from below by the sort of zero, um, zero point energy which is then the frequency y and uh, the same thing here it's just symmetric in x and y so, uh, so here we have somehow used that in, in such a valley uh, there will be some kind of um, zero point energy due to, to the narrowing of this, this uh, valley here <coughs> Uh, which then depends on how far out you are in the valley essentially so, uh, so bounding from below with these parts you get in total a, an operator which has uh, a potential which uh, goes to infinity in all directions so, um, <coughs> so uh, yeah so uh, because of this it has um, a compact resolvent and uh, so it has a discrete spectrum and also it cannot have a zero eigenvalue you can see this for instance by Sobolev inequality or something like this um, so this is uh, the interesting feature here that we on the quantum side we get actually a, a discrete spectrum for this operator and the same thing goes through uh, as, a, as I mentioned on the um, with this more complicated potential so essentially you can um, yeah, parameterize this in, in a smart way to see this. But then everything changes on the on the supersymmetric side. Uh, so we had this bosonic uh, operator, which we now know has a discrete spectrum. But then what happened here was that we added this uh, um, essentially a matrix <coughs> piece here. It's, it's linear in the coordinates, but then there is this matrix here also. Um, what we already know is due to the supersymmetry that this uh, operator uh, is the square <coughs> of, of something 
of some, uh, some self-adjoint operator. So we know already that even though we added this uh, part, which is not uh, definite, uh, it still is a non-negative operator. And actually it's really important, so for the supersymmetry, it turns out then you will have a, a matching between, you know, you cannot just change any of these terms with, a, with some um, uh, coupling constant or something, because it, ha it has to match up. There is also, in this case, a toy model. So essentially it's this uh, bosonic toy model with, a, with an additional piece. And um, so maybe I, it's useful to write it down. So it's so this is the supersymmetric toy model. It's essentially the same thing we had on the <coughs> on R two. Uh, then there is uh, on, on the, the identity matrix here, and then you have a, a part which you can write. So this depends on your taste, but one way to write it down is in terms of uh, two Pauli matrices. So this operator is acting uh, on, uh, so it's L2 on R2 with values in uh, C2, actually. So you have uh, the Pauli matrix is acting here. Yes. Yeah, I'm sort of confused why you say, uh, uh -huh, minus square root of x square, oh, okay. Yeah, okay, so minus exactly. So I'm looking at this piece here, yeah. which is sort of, this is the, the one which is, uh, ec uh, linear in the coordinates times a matrix, and if I square that, so the square of this part is just x squared plus y squared due to the Pauli matrix, matrices. So, um, so that means that the, this operator is bounded from below by uh, at least the, the negative square root of that. So this is uh, what you can use uh, on this side then, that the Whatever it is, okay, it can uh, become arbitrarily negative, but uh, it, it uh, essentially, if you go along a potential value, so if, if, um, if uh, y is zero and you go along x here, then you have just minus the uh, absolute value of x along this value. And this matches up exactly with this, with this um, uh, corresponding uh, harmonic oscillator, zero point energy. So what happens is that there is this, this uh, exact balancing out between the, the zero point energy of that oscillator and this fermionic um, operator here. So it turns out now that this uh, changes the spectrum again. So it's no longer a, a discrete spectrum, but it's rather a continuous spectrum on the positive real line. For, for this operator, it of course depends on, on which operator we consider, but this toy model <coughs> has uh, the same feature, essentially features as the real matrix models. Um, so it turns out that also in the, in the full matrix models, you can prove that this, uh, the, this corresponding operator has, a, um, it has, has a essential spectrum from zero to, to plus infinity. So what you do is essentially to, to use this, this fact that the, so you put, so on the fermionic side, you put yourself in, in a, where this is as small as it can be. And in the bosonic side, you, you take a state such that this is um, the smallest it can be, and that there will be this balance between these. And essentially you can construct then a, a sequence of states which sort of get pushed out into this valley and in this sense, a sequence of a uh, while, uh, while sequence of states. Um, so you can prove that there is, exists a sequence of um, yeah, s smooth um, and uh, rapidly decaying states. I think maybe you can even, okay, maybe not compactly support, well, you can take them compactly supported um, and normalized such that um, for any lambda greater than or equal to zero, uh, the Hamiltonian minus that uh, acting on these states goes to zero. <coughs> so this means that, that this uh, point lambda is in, in, uh, in the spectrum. The theorem is for the full... Uh, this is for the full, yeah, exactly. So this was uh, in David Lischer and Nikolai, uh, where they also used this toy model to illustrate the point. So in the toy model case, as I said, this was uh, 
so xi should correspond to putting yourself in the lowest energy here. And then uh, this phi is essentially the eigenstate in the transverse direction, and then the xi is used to as a cutoff uh, to move uh, into the valley. Why does it mean that the membrane is unstable? So, um, in some sense, it means that it costs zero energy to to just deform everything. You can move into this valley with zero energy cost. So, in that <laughs> in that sense, that uh, so what it means in these valleys, uh, if I understand correctly, is somehow you can form spikes of your membrane, and uh, so these spikes somehow you cannot see. Uh, somehow the uncertainty principle is not there to uh, to stop you from such sp spikes forming. So there is somehow <coughs> from the fermionic degrees of freedom there is a. Um, an extra, it allows you to somehow fluctuate with spikes. But I think in some, um, in some interpretations, then this is used as an advantage that you can somehow, if you have a, um, a membrane, it can somehow form a, a, a small uh, tube or a spike, and then it can maybe form a new um, membrane in, in, in some other section, and it's just connected by this little uh, tube. So somehow you, you're allowed to change the, um, the number of uh, membranes and, uh, and these things, that there's some kind of second quantized interpretation there, that it can fluctuate in the components and the topology <coughs> and everything. Okay, so then there was this um, uh, conjecture concerning um, the uh, existence of <coughs> ground states. So, so we should think about the case now that, uh, so concerning the spectrum, of uh, our uh, operator. So we know that this in all of these cases, the supersymmetric cases, um, you have a, a spectrum which is on the positive real axis. So this is the uh, spectrum of the supersymmetric Hamiltonian. And the question is really, what about the, um, the point zero in the spectrum? Is uh, somehow um, so whether there is some stability in the sense that uh, there, that you will have a lowest energy state where everything can somehow boil down to, um, or if it's just uh, you know if 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 there is no uh, normalizable ground state there, that somehow tells you that things are leaking out to infinity. There's no stability. So so the con conjecture was that in the highest dimensional case. <coughs> There should be uh, there should be a normalizable zero energy ground state, so this point should be um, an eigenvalue, and also that there is uniqueness there, so that there is only one such state. While in the lower dimensional models there should be no normalizable zero energy state for any matrix size, and also this. This statement was for all matrices. By the way, you separated the center of mass motion. The thing is... Yes, yeah, so this is right. now... So if I have a k square equals zero ground state, I would not see... I mean, if, I, if this is a massless ground state, it cannot be... I cannot go to the center of mass frame. Um, is it excluded by the formalism? No, I think that's just... Um, but I think that that problem probably trivializes the center of mass problem is somehow uh, a sub, you know you have somehow separated these things. So I think this on the center of mass side, this is probably just like a because particle. Gauges for the string when one quantizes the string. If you do it badly, you eliminate the massless concept. But okay. Yeah. Separately. Okay. But um, yes, let's discuss it. So. Um, so <coughs> this conjecture is uh, then uh, supported by various evidence. <laughs> so in the case, uh, uh, this the lowest, sort of the simplest case in the in the among the full matrix models, so the two-dimensional and uh, two by two matrices, uh, there is a, 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 a proof by contradiction due to uh, Jörg Frölich and, and Jens Hoppe. Um, so prove that there does not exist. That there does not exist uh, such um, 
Argon state. And if I understand it correctly, it's uh, again um, has to do with the, um, somehow the size of the battery or, or that. Um, <coughs> um, yeah, we, we, we will come to this, but there, there's sort of the geometry involved here, and whether there's, you know, whether these states are uh, essentially decaying fast enough at infinity. And this question was then addressed, uh, I guess it was discussed somehow in, in, in Hal um, the Halpern and Schwartz, but then Frölich, Graf, Hassler, Hoppe and Yao considered the asymptotics in the, also in the n equals 2 case, uh, essentially studying what happens along these valleys <coughs> and, and looking at the, uh, the equation um, I think on the, on the that uh, this is a um, zero energy state with respect to the supercharge uh, you can then see essentially wha what are the decay properties of such a state you know how is it decaying as you go out to infinity so so the question is is it decaying uh, fast enough <laughs> to uh, be normalizable or does it sort of maybe it does not even decay it could uh, also blow up or just stay constant or you know and there's uh, then you have to be um, you have to sort of know also the size of these valleys and so on so there's a lot of uh, interesting geometry in this then I, I guess uh, Pilin Yi will, will uh, tell us more about the Witten index approach however I should point out that in these models because of this uh, um, spectrum being uh, continuous and uh, and uh, you know various difficulties uh, of non so sort of non compactness here, uh, one has to be careful when we when you uh, make the uh, index uh, computations. <coughs> so you cannot just assume that you have a discrete spectrum and, uh, and work on that. So what I would like to point out, though, is. Um, the existence of embedded eigenvalues actually in the spectrum. So it turns out using this, um, uh, the way we can uh, define the model, um, choosing our fermions. So in the three and five case, when we chose the fermions the way we did uh, in this slide. So um, <coughs> since we could write down the Hamiltonian, uh, where the fermion number is preserved, then we can work on a sector where essentially you have zero fermions. So on that sector, this Hamiltonian just reduces to the bosonic Hamiltonian. So in these cases, uh, due to the existence of this complex structure, you can actually sort of just split. So you use this, this structure to somehow uh, split the Hilbert space into different sectors of, of fermion numbers and on one of those sectors the Hamiltonian is just the ordinary bosonic Hamiltonian and we know that the bosonic Hamiltonian has a discrete spectrum so in these cases there indeed exist <coughs> points in the spectrum which come from the bosonic Hamiltonian so, so that proves that there exist embedded eigenvalues in those uh, models uh, but this was in these cases the three and five so the problem is in the in the say two and nine dimensional case, we do not have this ca canonical structure, and indeed, essentially the best we can do is to have these um, uh, non-fermion number conserving terms, which then uh, mess up the whole picture. Somehow. So it's more it's difficult to see whether there is such a reduction in that case. So that was um, I'd like to point out here that we can <coughs> on the on the right Fox space sector, we have uh, the same Hamiltonian here. So another thing which is important to point out is in the three-dimensional case, you do have, um, you can write down states which are zero energy states, but they are certainly not normalizable. So essentially what you can use in this case that, you, um, that the supercharges can actually be written as essentially a, a Dirac operator, but uh, then uh, conjugated with, um, with, a, with a super potential essentially, which is uh, uh, of a, a, a cubic type. So you take essentially the, these, so, so in the three-dimensional case, you have also uh, more canonical uh, pairing up between all the, these, uh, essentially form a volume form in, this, uh, in the three dimensions, taking these three um, matrices. And so you use uh, the anti-symmetric tensor in three dimensions and then 
the structure constants. So forming um, a, a real valued function. So indeed this also has some properties like uh, <coughs> certain valleys where it's zero, certain uh, directions where it's actually blowing up positively and then blowing up on the negative side. So it's, uh, it's indefinite. But if you just write formally uh, a state uh, where you have essentially zero uh, fermions and then you multiply by this function, then this is, a, you know, it's a smooth function and it's, uh, it's uh, in the kernel of this um <coughs> of the supercharge, but it's not in the Hilbert space because of the indefiniteness of this. And then you have a, a similar state if you just switch the sign and you take the full fermionic thing. So, so in this, due to the structure, there exists such states, but they are certainly not uh, normalizable and they cannot be made normalizable just by um, changing. You have to really change the, um, um, the inner product of your Hilbert space a lot, uh, having exponential decay in order to accommodate such states. And also in the one-dimensional case, <coughs> there is um, essentially this you can think of as a plane wave model, or, or the, the supercharge is just uh, essentially a derivative uh, times a fermionic variable. So again, you can just take states which are constant with respect to that. So, uh, so either you take uh, zero fermions or full full number of fermions and then uh, acting with the derivative it's just zero. So, but this is, is again, it's a constant, so it's not in the Hilbert space, but it's somehow, it's better than this case because then uh, it's constant. So if you just change your, um, um, your inner product a little bit, you can somehow accommodate for it. So this is a, an interesting question whether one should somehow um, change the, this, uh, the normalization and and, and play around with whether th these types of states should be included or not. Um, <coughs> okay, so I, I will not uh, go into so much of the detail uh, on these um, different uh, approaches, but uh, essentially one approach is by construction. So you, you, s um, you write down uh, recursive equations on the different um, sort of ex expanding, so one, one approach is to expand, essentially Taylor expand the ground state around the, the point x equals zero and see uh, you know, how you can relate the, diff the higher order terms uh, to each other. So this has been sort of fruitful that we can find a, um, a unique state due to all the symmetries and everything, you can find a, a unique value for the, for the ground state at the the point zero, and then also I think at the to the first order, but then there might be more uh, possibilities if you if you go up in order. Uh, another approach has been to deform the model. So um, what you can do is somehow to single out some of the directions and, uh, and make a deformation, and then arrive at 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 a, di uh, a different model which still has the same. Um, complicated spectrum, a continuous spectrum, but it has somehow reduced in complexity on, on some other aspects. So this might be more um, uh, amenable to, to uh, computations. And another approach is to uh, somehow average with respect to symmetries. So again, you can, you can view the model in a certain direction or you know, uh, understand a certain <coughs> region or, or, or um, selection of the of the coordinates um, as essentially also a harmonic oscillator type of problem. And then it turns out that if you take this operator, which is then defined uh, in this direction, and you somehow average it over the directions, you will find the full uh, operator. So the hope is to be able to use some averaging techniques to, to, to arrive at the model. Um, and then uh, an uh, uh, another approach has been to try to investigate this case whether the zero energy states just are not in the Hilbert space but maybe they're sort of weakly in the Hilbert space so that if you just change your uh, normalization a bit or if you allow for um, uh, a slower decay or you know, either just having constant functions or, or a slow decay that you might uh, then spot the, uh, these states and uh, can somehow 
understand them from, from, from that perspective. Um, that uh, if you, yeah, that, that perhaps this is just a dimensional issue or that the, the, the decay is somehow there because of uh, um, the geometry and then um, so maybe there's in the, both in the two-dimensional case and in the nine-dimensional case there could be a, a, a ground state but it could turn out that it's in the higher dimensional case that the decay is, is, is uh, fast enough. Okay, so maybe I just flash some things here. So the, this concerned the, the uh, construction by recursive methods, essentially expanding the state uh, to higher orders in, in the coordinates and then considering the, the various um, um, conditions arising from, from it being a, a zero energy state. And then um, and you can find that in the in the nine dimensional case um, with only well n matrix sizes two, then uh, the you can understand this essentially the value <laughs> at the origin due to symmetry. So it uh, has to be a certain combination of of um, <coughs> states arising from the different representations here. We're we'll not going to the detail of this. And also Mikishita and Chachilevsky studied the higher orders. Uh, for this problem. Uh, the deformation case, uh, so essentially it's a little bit related to this uh, um, what happened in the three-dimensional case that you somehow consider <coughs> a cubic uh, superpotential if you want and then uh, where we somehow use, we single out some directions, sort of say, say the last two directions, 8 and 9, and also the, the indices 8 and 16 in the Clifford algebra. And then somehow you, you, you can, using that um, choices, those choices, you can write down something which is, uh, which is nice, and then you can somehow uh, deform your model with respect to this choice. And then you end up with, um, um, so there's a deformation parameter mu, and you end up with a Hamiltonian which then depends on this mu and in the case that mu is equal to 1 some of these terms drop out and you have a something which you can um, which is in some sense simpler but you can still prove uh, that this this deformed thing also has the the, the continuous spectrum then there is the averaging I will maybe not say so much about this uh, what I can say you know, so I have uh, three, three minutes. minutes. <laughs> okay. Five minutes. So maybe I can say a little bit about this uh, weighted approach. So, as I mentioned, the asymptotic analysis suggests to allow for more slowly decaying ground states. So we saw already in the d equals one this sort of um, degenerate model in some sense. There was this ground state which is just constant. So, uh, so the question is, uh, okay, maybe it's just that it's not decaying fast enough. So if we, so if we change the Hilbert space <coughs> a bit and we can somehow accommodate for such states. So, uh, so here I change it by adding a weight. So uh, it's the uh, original space, so uh, d, uh, rd times n squared minus 1 uh, with values in the formula in the Fox space. But then I change the measure here a bit. So I take this function rho. Uh, alpha, which is essentially just um, something which is decaying <coughs> as uh, x to the minus alpha. Uh, so alpha is uh, some weight parameter that you can play with. So uh, in this, um, so the new Hilbert space is just related to the old one with this function rho alpha. So then we can define uh, a Hamiltonian with respect to the new space. So h alpha but we define it just using the old um, quadratic form. So essentially, it's still q times the q acting on psi in the old norm. And then, I, so essentially, you, d you define this uh, as an operator, just say you start with the smooth functions with compact support, and then you, you take, uh, uh, this is a non-negative form, so then you can you know, take the corresponding Friedrich extension here. Um, 
but then there is a, an interesting sort of ground state correspondence here. So, so say that we had a, a state which is a ground, so, so if it was a ground state of the original problem, so it's in the original Hilbert space and uh, it's a zero eigenfunction of the, of the Hamiltonian H. But then since this uh, deformed or this weighted Hilbert space, it's, uh, it's, it's just bigger, you allow for more things here. So then it will also be in that space <coughs> and it will, because it's, uh, you know, it's a zero eigenfunction here, so it's, so it's annihilated by Q, so it's indeed also annihilated on this side. So, so any uh, ground state of the original problem is also a ground state of the weighted problem. But on the other hand, if you have a ground state of the weighted problem, then you can, uh, um, you know that this is annihilated by Q and you can use essentially um, elliptic regularity in these things so that you can conclude that this is actually a smooth function and it's annihilated by Q. So, okay, and it's also in, in that weighted space. But it could be, so you have essentially everything you want, but it might not just be in the, in the Hilbert space. So it's a useful thing to look at this um, space instead to, to see if there's so just some weakly bound states somehow in this problem. So and then what you can use is um, a certain spectral relation between uh, the problems. So if you want to see, you know, study the spectrum of the, of the weighted problem, it's the same as studying the spectrum of the original problem where you deform the Hamiltonian by say lambda times uh, this function rho alpha. So essentially if you want to see, to understand whether this has a discrete spectrum, then uh, you just have to sort of look at the negative eigenvalues of this problem. <coughs> and um, so, and, and also the question whether there is a zero energy ground state for the weighted problem is the same as whether this original Hamiltonian has a negative eigenvalue when you deform it in this way. So you throw in a, a, a negative potential which has this de decay, so x to the minus alpha at infinity. And you ask if, if there is always a negative eigenvalue there, then it means that this weighted problem also has a, a, a ground state, a normalizable ground state. So you, then you can sort of uh, use uh, spectral theory for these operators and so on. So wh what I did was to look at the toy model again, so this one, and apply this, uh, this procedure. And I, I find that the, for, um, if the weight is large enough, so if the decay is fast enough, so um, alpha bigger than two, then indeed this problem, um, the number of negative eigenvalues is bounded by a constant. So this means that this, in this picture, that there is a discrete spectrum. Okay, so maybe I can, I can, sorry, it's, yeah, uh, so I wrap up, uh, maybe I can just say that in, in this weighted picture you can consider essentially a weighted index to sort of try to count how many more states do you get in this, um, in this, uh, in the weighted case than in the original case. Uh, so that's one possible approach. So then there's uh, just this, uh, uh, final slide, uh, as I mentioned, one can continue co to construct the ground state um, uh, to higher orders around the origin. Um, study this deformed operator. There's also the question of uh, averaging of eigenstates. Um, the, uh, yeah, so what I, ha I have not uh, proceeded yet with this um, uh, approach to, to compute the weighted index for the toy model and, and, and the, in the matrix models. So that would be interesting as well. And then uh, we saw that there are embedded eigenvalues in, in certain dimensions, but what about the two and nine dimensional case? And at least in the two dimensional case, I think there is some kind of reduction you can make also with respect to symmetries. So that you can, in some cases, you can find um, I think you can, in the two-dimensional case, also discover a, a, a sort of a sector of the Hilbert space where you have a discrete uh, spectrum. So thank you very much. Thank you.
Yes. Yeah, just a comment because it happened to be the end of your talk, this d equals 2 case. I don't remember, so there is a paper by three uh, former Soviet Union. Yeah. One of them is the mother, where's Antal? Antal? Uh, the uh, mother uh, of the woman uh, who is who is uh, faculty in Brown. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what's her name? Arafifa? Right. Uh, so there is a, oh, I don't remember the time, but a nice paper about embedded eigenvalues in D equals 2. Yeah, this is exactly the one I was thinking of. So Arefeva, Koshelev, and Medvedev. Medvedev. Ah, yeah, right, you remember, Medvedev. Uh, Any <coughs> questions, comments? Yes, yes. But, uh, so this was very nice and a uh, lot of information. So <laughs> what is the final message? Uh, are you saying that this waiting could allow to find finally interesting ground states weakly decaying I, I yes. because I, I got lost at the end what is the main message yeah, yeah so so exactly the, the the main message is that the things depend uh, on the dimension somehow and it's it could just be that the, that the, even if if there is no state, it could still be just that it's uh, not normalized there is a state which is somehow decaying um, but it's not, yeah, it's weak, just weakly decaying. Yeah, so, um, so then maybe you can compare the two and the nine dimensional cases that, so I think both in the, I would somehow <laughs> suspect, but I don't know exactly what to ground it on, but that both in the two dimensional and the nine dimensional case, there is uh, such a weakly, uh, such a weak uh, ground state. But, at, but, but that in the nine dimensional case, it is, it's not uh, only a weak state, but it's also normalizable with respect to the original Hilbert space. Um, for the zero energy ground? Yeah, a zero, zero energy state. And that would also be embedded in still the continuous spectrum of the weak Nikolai. Uh, yes, yes, uh, it would, it's just uh, here in the, <laughs> in the end point of the spectrum. Yeah. One more question. So, <laughs> physics wise, what's the message? We have a center of mass motion that is just inertial, I guess. Yeah. And is it crucial to have a ground state, or is it not crucial, or, or what, what's the physics message? So this possibly someone else could, should respond to, but I think... Um, yeah, so I'm not sure exactly wh why you want to have a certain... Uh, or what the motivation is to... to to insist on a certain um, uh, Hilbert space, or if you have some interpretation, if 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 it turns out that your ground state is just not, it's just uh, um, barely normalizable somehow, uh, that b maybe you still have a, an an interesting interpretation of it. Does it mean that there is, for example, a continuous mass spec from this uh, That one, I think, is more interpreted in terms of this uh, case that you can deform the, the membrane, that you have these, I don't know, these spikes and tubes and so on. I, well, as I understand it, the, this continuous uh, spectrum indicates that you can um, easily move between different configurations. And then, but then I, I don't know exactly what, you know, if there's embedded eigenvalues, this is somehow stable, uh, more stable, but it seems it can still uh, <laughs> deform. I think what you need in the end is really to, to just um, split up the Hilbert space into the different sectors. And, on, you know, so you have uh, some of these, uh, you know, so on, on perhaps on the, so we, 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 we have the SUN symmetry which is actually not just a symmetry, but just a constraint. So everything should be there. But then we have the spin D, and that's not a constraint, but a symmetry. But there's also the part of the conjecture is also what about the symmetry of the ground state. So I think uh, uh, it is known that it should be, a ground state should be spin D symmetric somehow. So I, th so I think you can, if you split the whole Hilbert space down into different sectors with respect to the symmetry, then, uh, yeah, that <laughs> somehow then you would... Uh, uh, th there's also a question, you know, whether these, um, these spiky states, or whether, you know, these states you use to prove the continuous spectrum, maybe they are not 
uh, respecting the symmetry, actually. So maybe they, they are, that's just a sector which you can remove yeah. completely. Last, yes. So, so yes, BFSS wanted the ground state and claimed the ground state for some duality reasons, but maybe Pilgin has the best comment. You know these yeah, things. I mean, it, although we motivated here as a dynamic, regularized dynamics of membrane, this has also appears. It is essentially the same thing, but in the so-called M-theory hypothesis, there is an 11-dimensional theory that reduced to 10-dimension to no, string theory. And there is so-called Kaluza-Klein mode, momentum mode all along this compact circle. So this N, in, in case of SUN, N by N case, this unique state you are looking for is exactly this Kaluza-Klein particle. So this conjecture, I mean, not only n equals 16, 16 supercharge, but a <coughs> supercharge, four supercharge, come from essentially M theory and type two uh, superstring compactification. Mm -hmm. So there is a large number of physics ideas that goes into this conjecture. Maybe we thank our speaker and then continue.